19, and I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows. While Apollos was in Corinth, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Into what then were you baptized? He asked them. Into John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with the, back, with the baptism of repentance, telling people that they should believe in the one who would come up come after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and to prophesy. Now there were about twelve men in, in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, arguing and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened, and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples and conducted discussions every day in the lecture hall in Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the residents in Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands, so that even face clouds and aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases had left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Now some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists uh, also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus that Paul preaches. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, I know Jesus, I re and I recognize Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them, so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices, while many of those who had practiced magic connected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. In this way, the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. After these events, Paul resolved by the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and to go to Jerusalem. After I had been there, he said, it is necessary for me to see Rome as well. After sending to Macedonia, Two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, he said he himself stayed in Asia for, for a while. About that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. For a person named Demetrius, the silversmith who made silver shrines in Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, Men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You see and hear, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. Not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin, the very one all of Asia and the world worship. When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Ar Aristarchus, um, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Although Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the pro, uh, provincial of, officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to him, pleading with him not to venture into the amphitheater. Some were shouting one thing and some another, because the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some Jews in the crowd gave instructions to Alexander after they pushed him to the front. 
Motioning with his hand, Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. When the city clerk had calmed the crowd down, he said, People of Ephesus, what person is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis and of the image that fell from heaven? Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and do not do anything rash. For you have brought these men here who are not temple robbers, robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a case against anyone, the courts are in session and they are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it must be decided in a legal assembly. In fact, we run a risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today, since there is no justification that we can give as reason for this disturbance. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as an elder and one of the pastors here. This morning, I have the privilege of opening and sharing the Word of God with you. We today are in Episode 7 of our Acts Season 3 series, um, and as we posture ourselves for that, uh, I think uh, uh, some words from Tim Keller would help. Tim Keller describes revival as an intensification of the ordinary operations of the Holy Spirit which are conviction, conversion, assurance, and sanctification. He says, through the intensification of the ordinary operations of the Holy Spirit, there will be three things that are most visible. Sleepy Christians wake up, nominal Christians are converted, and conscious non-Christians come to faith. This is something we should desire to see, something we should pray for, something we should act towards, and something that should activate our mission for wherever God has placed us. This morning, we will learn more about the city of Ephesus. We will see these three things. We will see sleepy Christians wake up, we'll see nominal Christians are converted, and we'll see conscious non-Christians come to faith. We will witness what the catalytic moments are that strike up a revival in the individual and a revival within the church. The events in Acts 19 exhibit many characteristics of a revival. There is widespread spiritual awakening. There's transformation of individuals. Remember, as we spoke about sleepy Christians waking up, nominal Christians converted, and conscious non-Christians coming to faith. So there's a transformation of individuals and the transformation of the society that those individuals live in. And there's a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. Through our theme, we'll witness a revival Um, In Ephesus, looking at five points, Um, the word of God is the first one. We look at the power of God, the magnification of Jesus, turning to God and demolishing idols and transformation of the city. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that um, we get together as your people to sing songs of praise and worship to you, to fellowship with one another, and to sit under the lordship of your word. This morning, you have an appointment with all the people that are here you know where each individual is. Some may be sleepy, some may be nominal Christians, some may not know you. Would you call and draw them to yourself through your word? Would you speak and move by the power of your spirit? Would you use my voice, but it would be your words as you speak and touch your people? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So our first point, the word of God. Acts 19 is part of Paul's third missionary journey. In the beginning of Acts 19, we are introduced to Paul being in Ephesus. This is a picture of a map, and there is a pin which shows where Ephesus is on that map. It is in Asia. Left of this, left of Ephesus is Athens in Greece, as you will see on the map, and to the right you will see Turkey. This is another map, a smaller map, that shows the journey that Paul would travel in his third missionary journey. This map, which you might have seen some variations of it, shows a cluster of the seven churches of Asia, which have a yellow circle near the name of those churches. It shows the journey of Paul beginning at Antioch and through Ephesus, and he spends a period of about three years through in Ephesus. Then he goes through Macedonia to Corinth, 
ultimately to Jerusalem looks a little bit like a long run, but Paul is on mission and on the move. In Ephesus, Paul meets 12 men, which will come, we won't come back to the 12 men for time, but basically within the first 10 verses of Acts 19, we see an understanding of how to be saved. And then in from verse 8, we see in Ephesus, Paul enters the synagogue and he spoke boldly for three months, teaching about the word of God. Paul encounters opposition from those whose hearts are hardened. These individuals oppose the word of God publicly and the NIV translation says they refused to believe. They would have heard the word of God. It might have made some sense. It isn't that the words Paul used did not make sense. Some of them heard what Paul was saying and they refused to believe and they publicly opposed the message that Paul shared. This is a picture of Game Changers, a pro-plant-based net health Netflix documentary. Um, it speaks about the benefits of not eating uh, meat because plant-based food shows improved blood circulation. It shows reduced inflammation and it, it contributes to overall longevity. The study also shows real examples like a sports team which proves the benefits of a plant-based diet in their recovery and in their performance. Real examples of a runner who wins a marathon of 160 kilometers in distance a couple of times. It even goes to speak about the teeth composition of man. I heard this message, fam. I fully understood the message. <laughs> I recall speaking to Jono uh, Tadho from Rooted, who started the diet. Uh, he affirmed how good he's feeling how true the change is, and I said I understand the message. <laughs> but I refuse to follow the message. <laughs> so if you hope to affirm the message, then just like Paul, consider moving along, for this heart is hardened, <laughs> and find some softer soil. So Paul, after three months of teaching in the synagogue, finds a position of the gospel in a public nature, and he moves on away from those people. He moves to the hall in Tyrannus. It is a lecture hall. The owner, Tyrannus was the owner of the lecture hall. It is a school in Ephesus. Uh, in verse 10, he, he does this for two years. That is what it shows us. He's talking with the disciples. He's teaching those that heard his message from the synagogue that he left with. He teaches every day between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., a time when workers had their midday meal and rested from their work and the heat of the day. What a time to be alive, fam. So Paul would have been working as a tent maker during other parts of the day and taught during this time of the day when it was siesta time, when it was eating time and sort of rest time. The end of verse 10 says, All the residents of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of God. The whole of Asia Minor then was being saturated by the gospel, not just the lecture hall in Ephesus. This means as the gospel is continuously taught, there is a transformation and a mobilization of people who believe and continue to share and reteach this message. We see in verse 20 as well, in this way the word of the Lord spread and prevailed. Verse 26, we're introduced to, to Demetrius, who says the message that Paul is teaching is reaching a lot of people and causing him a lot, a loss of business. So we come, we'll come back to Demetrius in a bit. Um, but what we're seeing here is the gospel taught continuously. And we're seeing that that is a part or a start of the revival. It is a part of the start of the spiritual awakening. Individuals encountering the living God through the Holy Spirit, leading to faith, repentance, and transformation. Leading to conviction, conversion, assurance, and sanctification. The continuation of this teaching of the word has a catalytic effect of transforming Ephesus and transforming Asia. And again, this wasn't only Paul teaching, as people would come to the city of Ephesus, would come to the lecture hall in Tyrannus, but would leave and would continue to teach the message that they had heard. So it is not only the past of the preacher, but the same power of transformation is at hand for the individual or the city through the open Bible. If we want to see the same thing in the city of St. Children, we need to work, we need to teach with consistency and with patience as we see the model of Paul. So how are you contributing to this? Our second point, the power of God. In Ephesus, there are also miraculous signs and wonders. The main word that we should see here is extraordinary. The word extraordinary means beyond what is, not, what is ordinary and usual. 
It is highly unusual or exceptional or remarkable. Part of what is extraordinary is that the garments Paul has are being stolen. Um, a face cloth, in other versions, it says a handkerchief and aprons were being stolen. The apron is a piece of clothing that would help protect the clothes of the tent maker, because for, for Paul was a tent maker. I suspect that he would wear it whenever he would find one, as these were continuously being stolen. Along with the apron that was being stolen is a handkerchief. In this day and age, a handkerchief was used sort of like a sweat band that would be around the neck and would help in catching sweat or wiping sweat instead of the modern day approach of blowing your nose. Sort of like this, fam. This is a handkerchief. I know uh, you might not believe it is mine. Yes, it is mine. <laughs> this is a handkerchief. What they would do is they would tie it around the neck uh, to remove sweat. Do not worry, it has not felt the tip of my nose. <laughs> so the same as this handkerchief and the apron of Paul, these were being stolen. The important thing to understand and know is that the actual handkerchief and the apron have no actual power, but the faith of the people in trusting they would be healed is part of how the extraordinary healing happens. So don't try to touch my handkerchief. God honors the faith of these people who touched these garments. With faith that they would be healed, God sees that and God honors that. There is no actual power in these garments. In this day and age, we have holy water, we have holy oil, we have a prayer cloth. These are some of the modern day known items used by church people as objects to provide healing. These all have no healing power themselves, but God may honor those who believe that they would be healed in faith through these objects. We should remember that the greatest miracle is already seen in the death of Jesus for our sins that makes us alive in Christ. Having a new birth, having a new heart, this is the greatest miracle. We should not expect miracles as if these are ordinary, but in actual fact are extraordinary. God can and does heal. He is all-powerful. God is still at work even if we don't see the extraordinary miracles as we remember the most extraordinary miracle in Jesus on the cross for us. The third point, the magnification of Jesus. Some of the miraculous signs, wonders, and expression of God's power is seen in the authority given to Paul to heal and to cast out demons for those possessed by demons. Just a quick side road, some background into Ephesus that will be helpful in understanding what is happening here. The city of Ephesus was renowned for its wealth, for its culture, and religious significance. In the New Testament, Ephesus served as a key location for the spread of the early Christianity. We see this in Acts 19 during the Roman period. Ephesus became the capital of the province of Asia Minor and a center for political and economic activity. Ephesus was home to the temple of Artemis, Diana in Roman mythology. The temple is one of the seven wonders of the world, and her temple attracted pilgrims, tourists, contributed significantly to the city's economy. Artemis was one of the many idols that gripped this city. People loved Artemis, and people believed that she was the reason the city flourished as a goddess of fertility. We're introduced to Demetrius, who is a silversmith, Basically, someone who works with modeling metal. His livelihood, his work was creating objects, idol objects of Artemis. Besides the worship of Artemis, Ephesus also had a mix of Greco-Roman gods, so they believed in other gods that they worshipped within the city. Ephesus has a mix of religious, religious uh, religions, and later a significant Christian presence starts to develop. Sport was also one of the attractions of the city with a big amphitheater or a sports stadium that, that would have people visit this city. We will see this in Acts 19 as the story unfolds. So because there's a lot of worship of foreign gods, there's also a lot of demons possessing people. Because in reality, worshiping the demons, as they worship these demons and worship these other gods, they possessed by these demons. So in verse 14, we're introduced to the seven sons of Sceva, Acts 19, verse 13. Now some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists also attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the name that Paul preaches, by the name that Paul preaches. They are itinerant Jewish exorcists, literally itinerant basically meaning people who move from one place to the other. So these are the exorcists who move from one place to the other, have made their job or provide their own income performing exorcisms. 
They are using the name of Jesus as a way to qualify themselves. Let me repeat, to qualify themselves as though sent or given authority by Jesus. So Skeva is a, is a Jewish high priest. Um, he's got these seven sons. These are the sons who have seen Paul preach and seen Paul cast out demons uh, in the name of Jesus. And therefore, they misuse the name of Jesus to make a living for themselves. They don't know Jesus. They don't have authority to cast out demons. They command the demons in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches about instead of the Jesus they know. This is a picture of the Water Tluf Air Base. It is a national key point. It is used by the military, um, humanitarian, humanitarian operations, or commercial air traffic emergencies. In 2013, as narrated by the Citizen newspaper, there was a likely humanitarian operation or traffic emergency uh, as, a plane, as a plane landed to enable its occupants to attend a wedding at Sun City. So the former head of state protocol enabled this landing of the plane. Uh, he name-dropped the former president's name and other ministers implying they had given him authority and approval for this. So the misuse of authority led to significant public outcry and government investigation. The former head of state protocol later admitted to name dropping, was recalled and likely embarrassed by the process of having to resign. So the sons of Skeva, seeing Paul use the name of Jesus, see an opportunity to make some money for themselves to exercise demons, they name drop Jesus and the spirits don't recognize them. Acts 19 verse 15, I know Jesus and I recognize Paul, but who are you? The New King James Version says, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? The word know in the Greek is different in the first and second instances as we see here. In Greek, the first know is translated as gnosko, which means relational or experiential know. So the demons know Jesus experientially. They have encountered God. They know the power and the authority of Jesus by experience. Bautwaganama, which means directly translated, they know through their skin, or rather learn personal bodily experience of who Jesus is. The second know is translated as epitomai, which means know about or, or, or knowledge about. So they have knowledge about who Paul is, knowledge about the authority that Paul has. So the evil spirits know Jesus experientially as God and Son of Man, and they know Paul as one given authority by Jesus. Then they question who the seven sons are. The evil spirits overpower these seven men, beat them. Spirits are known to have extraordinary strength, so this one individual with his with spirits defeats these seven. So much so that the Bible paints a picture of them without their clothes on, humiliated. So name dropping went wrong again. If you're a Christian, this is a warning not to use the name of Jesus in vain or as if the name of Jesus gives you authority. Yeah. Acts 19 verse 17. When this became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, they became afraid and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high esteem. The Passion Translation uses the words, all the people in Ephesus were awestruck. They were in awe at the authority of the name of Jesus as they witnessed the teaching of Jesus as they witness the power of Jesus, as they witness Jesus, the name that's able to, ex uh, to, to, to remove demons from people. Jesus is supremely powerful. Jesus is all-powerful. And he has the authority. Only in the name of Jesus is the authority. Our fourth point, turning to God. We see in the picture of revival, the main catalyst being the word of God, we saw this in the beginning, being taught. So Paul teaches, and there's transformation that continues to happen, happen as he faithfully teaches the word of God. People knowing the word of God in the city of Ephesus becomes transformed. We also see the power of God through the spirit moving. We see miraculous signs and wonders happening, all expressively to magnify the name of Jesus, in particular in a city that is confused by magic, and other gods. So the extraordinary miracles all point to and show and affirm the supremacy of the name of Jesus. And that is why these extraordinary miracles are happening, to proclaim the name of Jesus. We're seeing the power of God in the name of Jesus being supreme above all others and exalted above all, including idols and casting out demons. No spells or magic or other gods can do. People in Ephesus then come and lay down their idols as they in awe of who God is, they turn to God as they see and are awestruck by God. 
They're coming, they come burning their idols and books as they affirm that Jesus is to be exalted above the magic and other idol worship. These were most likely Christians who had complex backgrounds that might have included witchcraft or, or magic and similar kind of spirit, spirituality. It would be easy for us to say that they should have turned away from these things in the beginning. And yes, they should have in the beginning. But the process of sanctification, the process of being made holy, where you are putting off the old and putting on the new, is a long process. It is a continuous process. These Christians have these practices or traditions that they see are, are powerless and empty as compared to the exalted Jesus. So they are met by the power of Jesus and see that where they placed their hope, there was no hope and there was no life. They therefore publicly bring their books, charms, and all that is associated with the magic or spiritual traditions that move them away from God. They burn them as an act of cutting off these practices. The ESV study Bible says these books or things brought to be burned were worth 50,000 pieces of silver. A day's wage could be considered around 300 rand and therefore multiply by by each silver for a day, you get roughly about 50 million. So this is the value. This is the magnitude at which these people are cutting off and putting off the old and putting on the new. This demonstration is like what we demonstrate in water baptism. It is a public demonstration, demonstrating new life, death of the old publicly. We're a new creation, the old life. Magic incarnations, idols are all dead. One of the things that happen when you become a Christian is that you get a new heart. You get new affections. You get new joys, new interests. Old loves and desires die. We see the revival. We see the word of God being taught faithfully. We see the spirit moving. We see Jesus being exalted as catalytic moments that bring the revival and turn the city of Ephesus to God. These people turn from Artemis, turn from their idols, burn them in public, demonstrating and affirming what they believe. What are the practices that you need to turn from? Practices that you might have known in your old life. Practices that you need to let burn, that you need to let it burn, that you've got to let burn. Are you living a life that exalts Jesus? We send consuming fire, fan into flame, a passion for your name. What passion is being fanned into flame in your life? Yeah. Is your life a reflection of asking God to fill you and you with himself? Or are you holding the tap to which you fill yourself? Like the city of Ephesus, there was other false gods that promised to satisfy. And we too have similar types of gods. Comfort, mildly scrolling, alcohol, Pornography and the list goes on. Are you putting these to death? Martin Luther says, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. Yeah. Martin, Martin Luther believed that a God is something that people look to for help and good and that true faith and confidence in God are essential. He also believed that the same confidence and faith can make something an idol. And that if a person's confidence is false, they do not have the true God. What is at the center of your life? Where is your faith and confidence placed? Is it calling out to the name of the Lord to have his way? Or are you having your way? Ephesians 4 verse 21 to 24 reads as follows. If you have really experienced the anointed one and heard his truth, it will be seen in your life. For we know that the ultimate reality is embodied in Jesus. And he has taught you to let go of the lifestyle of the ancient man, the old self life, which was corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from delusions. Now it's time to be made new by every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness, and you now belong to him in the realm of true holiness. There is clearly an adoration of Jesus which transforms the individual. This adoration comes from hearing the word, from being transformed by it, encountering Jesus, and seeing Jesus as the exalted king whose name is above all other names. 
our last one, transformation of the city. Verse 21 to 23, we see Paul planning to make his way to Jerusalem through Macedonia. The rest of the book of Acts is outlined here. Paul will go to Jerusalem through Macedonia. It is a long route, but he gets then ultimately to Rome. In Jerusalem, he will be giving an offering for the poor. This is the life of Paul. He's sharing the gospel in the city, serving and caring for the people in Jerusalem, and he's uniting the mission of Big C Church in teaching. He's going to Jerusalem. He sends two of his fellow workers ahead of him, but he stays in Asia. While Paul is in Asia, he writes the letter to the Corinthian church. Paul is focused on the mission. The mission is his life. Christ is his life. Paul echoes the words of a song we sing, send me to the nations, send me to the neighbors, and send me with your love. Before he leaves Asia, my Bible says there's a disturbance about in the way. Christianity was referred to as the way before it was called Christianity. Christianity was called the way because it was about Jesus and he was the way. Not a way, but the only way to heaven, the only way to life and the only way to salvation. What follows next is the disturbance. Paul in his teaching, in the spirit moving, in people turning away from idols, in people turning away from Artemis, in the revival happening, offends some. Demetrius, who we spoke about earlier, a metal worker who created idols linked to the goddess of fertility, assembles people to work in creating idols or magic because they're losing money as people turn from idols. So, so Demetrius is calling people together because he is losing money. So just a quick side road. Artemis, the goddess, the goddess that is worshipped in Ephesus, is linked to the economy. Artemis is the goddess of fertility seen in the image of the statue which shows uh, this goddess with three breasts, and it is also linked to wealth as well. So wealth and prosperity is what is linked to this goddess. So much so, much so that in the temple, loans are given out. So the loans are going down. People aren't worshipping Artemis. They aren't buying idols created by Demetrius and, and the other people within the city who've made a living. They have now placed their hope and faith in Jesus and not idols. Verse 27, Paul is saying, uh, which we've read before, that God's made by hands aren't God's. These are the words that Paul uses as well to turn the people's minds to focus back on the real true God. So the crowd assembled by Dimitri took two of Paul's companions to the amphitheater, to the stadium. Paul wanted to go before this group, before this people, um, to defend and speak on behalf of his, his companions. Um, but Dimitri, some of his companions say no. Some of the disciples call him not to go. Um, Dimitri is busy instigating a people because of this lost income, because of their idols being discredited by a real God. So when they heard this, when these people that are brought together heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out. Great as Artemis of Ephesians. Already at this time, the city is filled with confusion. They have already taken two of Paul's co-workers to the amphitheater. Verse 31 even says that some of the provincial officials plead with Paul not to go to the stadium to address the crowd for fear of what is to come. This crowd themselves is confused as we see some shouting one thing, the other shouting another thing. The provincial official basically says everything will be fine, Artemis will be fine. Then the city clerk comes up and stands before the people and says that there is no crime here. These people aren't temple robbers, they aren't blasphemers, these people aren't speaking against Demetrius. But if Demetrius feels that they are, then he should come and lay a charge. And that this is not a valid and legitimate gathering then he dismisses the assembly. What is important to note bet between verses, verses 21 and 41 is that there's a transformation of a city that is happening. A transformation that is happening because the gospel was shared and because the power of God is seen and Jesus is magnified. Some people in the city see the transformation happen and they rebel and push against it. But we can see that revival continues through the word being taught, through the power of God being seen, Jesus being magnified and people turning to God and people turning away from their idols in a public manner. So how should we respond to Acts 19? What should it mean to us? 
we should realize that we live in a time that is not so different from Ephesus. We live in a time where people call themselves Christians but don't live in a, in a visible participation with the character of a Christian. Ephesus worshipped Artemis and other idols. This is how we see, this would be similar to us in this day and age. We live in a, in, in a similar city like Ephesus. We also have our own Artemis. We also have our own gods that we run to. Some would be cultural, societal, and economic systems where there's an expression of materialism, superstition, or entities revered as a source of prosperity, protection, or identity. There's materialism and consumerism as one. The pursuit of wealth, of status, and material possessions. What do you have fanned into flame? Is it your identity at work? Is it your pursuit of a new house? Your collection of degrees? Or your pursuit of a master's or a doctorate? Traditional practices and ancestral worship is another Artemis or idol. Relying on ancestors or traditional healers for fertility, protection, or prosperity. Do you believe that Jesus is all-powerful? Is this seen in your belief and expression of life? Do you speak to the dead and seek guidance? Isn't God the only one who has conquered death? The idolization of celebrities is another influences or sports figures? Do you spend more time following and idolizing people than following Jesus? One of the prayer points that I do hear often and praying for is the revival of the heart. People asking for a revival of the heart. What does this actually mean? And what are people asking for? I believe people are asking for God to have his way in their lives. But then, is he a priority in their lives? Revival is from the Word of God. It's from studying the Scriptures. It's from the power of God, meeting and encountering God through faith in Jesus. Magnification of Jesus. As you gnosco Jesus, as you know experientially Jesus. Turning to God and demolition of idols that hold you back. If you want revival, are you studying the Word of God? Not just reading it. Are you teaching others this Word that you have heard? Are you meditating it? To show how hard my heart is with the pro-based diet, I'm going to use one more example. Studying the Word of God is not quickly eating the stew. It is slowly eating it. It is identifying the flavors as you enjoy it. Maybe it's also best enjoyed as you share with others what you feel, what you taste, and what you experience. Are we just reading the Word of God? Are we meditating it? Are we reading it for all it's worth? Are we immersed in it? Are you studying the scriptures if you want revival? Are you meeting and encountering God? Paul was not often alone. He had fellow workers. He sent some. He stood with others. He was not alone. Are you coming to places where other believers meet, other believers do life? Your coming to church is important because it is not only for you to hear the word of God encouraged and to be sent out into the week, but it is also others who experience you and what God is doing in your life and your journey and are encouraged. Are you trusting God in your life? Are you heeding to the Holy Spirit calling you to delete that app, to unsubscribe from that subscription, to wake up earlier, to live in the light and to speak to someone? Are you exalting Jesus in your life? Are you growing in affection for Jesus or affections of things of the world? As I say, things of the world, they are things that are coming to mind. Don't miss this opportunity to bring these before God. Don't miss the opportunity to confess these and to kill them where they are. Who are you praying for? Who are you speaking to? Who are you teaching? Is Jesus at the center of it all? Or are you? Let's pray. I'm going to leave a few moments of quiet. You may want to speak to God and tell God where you are. You may want to lay those idols before his feet. Lord Jesus, 
We thank you for your word that continues to teach. It's got the power to transform, the power to wake up sleepy Christians, the power for nominal Christians to be converted, and the power for conscious non-Christians to come to faith. There are people that sit here or that listen on the audio platforms. You know where they are. Would you do a work in their heart? Would you call them to yourself? If there are things that are keeping them from growing in knowledge of you, would you make those things come to the fore? Would you help them by the power of the Spirit to turn from idols and to turn to you? As we see and hear this word, as we read this word, as we see a revival in the city of Ephesus, may it be something that we desire for our individual lives, but also for the city that you've placed us in. Would you help us that even as we sing words like, here I am, send me, as we sing words like, send me to the nation, send me to the neighbors, that these would ring true in our hearts. That as the gospel continues to transform us, that you would send us so that all the earth would hear your word, would hear about your goodness. Would you do a work in our hearts? Would you draw us nearer to yourself? Would Jesus be at the center of it all? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.